Aquinas says about this and then make that mine or to see what Charles Stanley says about it and make that mine. And I thought, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to just read your word and you make it mine. Give me what I need to hear. And once I started doing that, it was completely life-changing, I'm just going to say. Um, and I, I think that probably I'm not the only one in the room that has done that. But I have asked for forgiveness, and now I'm, I'm trying to go through repentance, and it's just very timely because we're getting ready to start the book of Micah. And we're going to talk about God's judgment. We're also going to learn about his justice and his mercy and his grace. And I think that I have noticed that since COVID, we're just not quite like we were. And I'm thinking, what is it? What do we need to do? And as I prayed about it, my daddy was a jokester, and I remember this story he used to tell. And he would say, this was it in a nutshell, and I think it'll make sense. But he said one time there was a man and woman, they'd been married about 30 years, driving down the road in a pickup truck they'd had since they'd been dating. And he's over here at the window doing his thing, and she's at her window looking out and doing whatever, and she looks over at him and says, do you still love me? And he said, well, yeah, why would you think I didn't? She said, well, you know, when we first started dating, we held hands and we talked all the time. And, you know, when we got in this truck, I was right beside you, right up under your show. Almost you'd put your armor, around me. I was right there with you. And we don't do that anymore. And he just looked at her and said, well, I haven't moved. <laughs> and I thought, okay. <laughs> well, apply that scripturally. God has not moved. We keep sliding away. And I, when I say we, I mean myself. So today's music is going to be a little bit different. We are actually going to go through um, a series of songs that I'm hoping will be a prayer because maybe somebody in this room is where I was and still am. We cannot have revival and we cannot have an awakening unless we have first a time of prayer for forgiveness and repenting in my heart. Um, so I, I want us to sing this song. You don't know it. I'm going to tell you right now, you don't know the first song. And we're going to sing through the verses, and we're going to ask you to join us on the chorus. It's an easy song. We'll be singing it for a few weeks so that we can teach you the whole thing. But the chorus starts with, God, would you forgive us? Find us on our knees. Come show us what our church can be. And I, I think maybe as a whole, we kind of need to think, wh what is it? What is it that's missing? Did the Holy Spirit just cut me off because I was talking too much? But like I said, this, this is going to be a more prayerful set of songs this morning. So um, when we finish the first song, Bruce is going to have a time of prayer, and then we'll go into some other songs. So for this first one, just stay seated. But we've got the words, so just look at the words. And I just challenge you, I, I feel so guilty that maybe we haven't been teaching as much as we should have about what worship is. And it's not coming in here to sing. Worship is what we're all called for a purpose, Bible school again. And the one purpose we all share is to worship God. And, you know, I didn't think about, I know singing is part of worship, but so is writing a letter to a friend. So is checking on a homebound person. So is the attitude when we come in here. I, I have always been a gas station Christian. I work and work and work all week, and I come in here to get my tank filled like I would my car at the gas station, and it's backwards. I should be serving and reading the Word and spending time with God all week so that I'm so full when I get here, I've got to give that to God. So I just thought maybe I'm not the one that's going through something like that, but I want to take time once in a while to share my heart. And um, I hope this song will resonate with you. And if you feel like coming to the altar at any time during the service, come down here. Don't let it, I mean, are people going to look at you funny if you walk down? Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. They just might. But what's more important, coming and getting things right with Christ or what people think? See, all that stuff that we do that we think is so important and it is so meaningful and it, we define our success by it, it's like this song says, castles in the sand, and you know what happens to them. The water comes and they're gone. That stuff is not lasting. Um, anyway, go ahead, Daniel, get us started. <coughs>
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. I want to see. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart.
sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit going through us because, you know, the way I understand it as a Christ follower is that the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit should not be a strange thing to the church. It should be a common occurrence that when we come to church, when we get to this place, there's nothing special about this building. What makes this place special is the people right it's uh, the head is what makes the body of Christ special Jesus Christ and we only come to the father through Christ by the Holy Spirit and so because we're believers God in his sovereignty planted this church God planted West Oxford Baptist Church and he still has a plan and purpose for her to go out into the into the highways and proclaiming the gospel making disciples and so there shouldn't be a strange thing to that we would come here to sense the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And it should be that when we come together that we're not looking to fill up our tank. It should be something going on in our tank because we have walked with God throughout the week. Why? Because we're not looking at a church building to fix us. There's only one Savior, and his name is Jesus. And as we are walking daily with Jesus and allowing his word to transform us and allowing the Holy Spirit to use his word to transform us, that we just live life, right? As we just live life and walk in the spirit, God does incredible things to us. And so one of the most important things that we do as a church is when we come together, man, we are excited about what Jesus has been doing in our lives this week because we've walked with Jesus, right? Doesn't mean we have everything all figured out. Doesn't mean that we had a great week. It just means that, man, I belong to Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives in me and he's working through me. I'm walking with Jesus, right? It's not a tag on. My, my relationship with Jesus is not a tag on. I don't put Jesus in a compartment and then I bring him out on Sunday. Jesus is the same day Sunday as Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then I come together as a body of Christ to be reminded. And so open up your book the Bible, to the book of Micah, the book of Micah. Let's look at what God says, wants to say to his people. You know, Micah was nobody special. He was from a southern part of Jerusalem. He was nobody special. But he was somebody that God chose to go and proclaim the word of God to. Micah. So why Micah? Well, because God is speaking through his prophet. 
And whenever you see in the Old Testament, like in Micah chapter 1, you see the word of the Lord came. So the, the Jews never questioned that this, that when you see that, that they were speaking for God. The Jews never questioned it. Uh, people, the Jews would not question that Micah is the word of God. Why? Because it was spoken by Micah. So the word of God, when the, when the prophet spoke, they, know, they knew that he was speaking for God. And so God raised up this prophet to speak forth the word of God. So why Micah? Well, because Micah is in the Bible, and it's this, the eternal word of God, and it has a word for us. Some people say, well, I, I read Micah. I've been reading Micah, you know, and I encourage you to read it over and over as we walk through this book together, as we spend weeks going through the book together. And some say, well, it kind of goes back and forth, you know. It, it kind of goes judgment, salvation, judgment, salvation. It's really intense, and it backs off, and it kind of picks back up where it left off, and then it goes for, you know, why is that? Well, because, again, it's, it's the Word of God. God is working. He's, he's speaking through this individual. And remember, he is writing to a people who, for the most part, can't read. They're literate. And if you want to teach somebody about God and how to remember about who God is, you, you teach him in a, in a poetic way. And so it's, it's kind of poetic, it's the way it goes back and forth. It doesn't follow our line of reasoning as an American, you know, that if it begins on the left, it's got to end on the right. No, that's, that's not the way it is with God. He's perfect, he's holding his just, and so you can't use the book of Micah like a five-minute devotion. You know, and that's our problem as Americans, and that's, that's what I'm praying for this church, you know, is that we get comfortable just being in the presence of God and allowing and enjoying that solitude. Uh, put down your phone. Put down the busyness and just allow yourself to be still and to be able to read and just to listen, enjoy this relationship that you have with God so that you can hear from him. The word of the Lord came to Micah. God is going to speak to his people. He's going to speak to the northern kingdom, and he's going to speak to the southern kingdom. And if you know anything about history in the Bible, uh, you will know that this great nation of Israel uh, became divided, as you see in this slide here, right? Uh, why did they come, this, this great nation, this one people under God to follow God, right? They became divided. Why? Because of sin. And it started in Solomon, right? He had everything. The guy had all the wisdom of the world, the, the wisest man who ever lived, but yet he allowed sin to creep into his life. He, he allowed the things of the world to, to damper his relationship with God, that clouded God out, that deadened God. And as a result, he had, to, he had consequences of that sin. And it would come through one of his sons. One of his sons would eventually, uh, you know, not listen to good advice, and he would listen to the wrong advice. He wouldn't be listening and following God. And so as a result, he listened to man and not God. As a result, the uh, kingdom got mad, and the, the northern kingdom got mad and split off from them. And they became two kingdoms. And so you had, uh, basically you had uh, the kingdom of Israel uh, to the north and you had the kingdom of Judah to the south. Basically it just existed of two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. And so this is a context that we find the, the book of Micah. And as I was praying about God, what do you want to uh, what book of the Bible, what do, what do you want to say to us? Why the book of Micah? And I love the question, and this is a question we're going to ask ourselves every time we're in the book of Micah, is who is like Yahweh? I mean, that's what Micah means. It's who is like Yahweh. In other words, who is like our Lord? Now, this only, you can only ask that question if you truly belong to Jesus. If you belong to Jesus, you can walk around saying, who is like the Lord? And the Holy Spirit's going to say to you, nobody. There's only one God under heaven. There's only one supreme. There's only one sovereign God. There's only one, and there's only one way to this God, and it's through Jesus. 
And if you know that, that means you have the Holy Spirit. That means that you have to follow and be who you are, that you're a child of God and you are to follow this God because life is not about us. Uh, it's no, you know, 2022 is no different than 531 BC. It's still life. There's still God. We still have a plan and a purpose. And what happened here with the nation of Israel, the northern and southern kingdom had abandoned God. And they're going to reap what they have sown. Pray with me. Holy Spirit, I pray to be removed from this pulpit so that the people can hear from God Almighty. That the Holy Spirit would take the word of God and, and deliver us from bondage. And bondage is not necessarily something that we even recognize in our lives. It's not something that we necessarily see as bad. But bondage is anything that is not the freedom of the Holy Spirit. And God, you want a people that are free. And money has nothing to do with freedom. Uh, the things of this world, what we think means freedom, has nothing to do with what you think is freedom. True freedom only comes from the Holy Spirit. And so I pray that you would show us that today. I pray that as a result of your word that we would sense the direction and leadership of the Holy Spirit. Because of, of, without the leadership and direction of the Holy Spirit in this church, we are in trouble when it comes to the things of God. And we need to see God do things here that only, that only you can do. Not for our sake, not for our name, not so that we can boast in ourselves, so that we can lay everything down at your feet and worship you. And I truly do believe that when we really do start seeing the Holy Spirit work in our lives, we will start seeing this place transformed. Because you will be doing things only you can do. And I pray that we'll be again today. So you're going to see that the book of Micah speaks to us today. Why? Because we are tempted to live in rebellion. Even as Christians, we're tempted to rebel against God because we're not listening to the voice of God, right? We're, we're all these other voices, all these other things are, are dampering or, or, or quenching of the Holy Spirit. We're also very tempted to have idols in our lives. And I know we have idols in our lives because we're not walking in the freedom of the Holy Spirit. So God's word is going to address some of those idols. Micah speaks today because we are a people who are deadened. We're wanting a God of the past. We're wanting a God to look like what we think God should look like. And God's like, I'm not a God of yesterday. I'm a God of today. And that's why Micah is going to speak to us. We're also a forgetful people. I mean, isn't that one of the purposes of church is to come together to remind one another who God is? Do we forget that what we've been redeemed from, that we've been forgiven that we're being empowered, that what we have access to, all these things that we forget. Micah will also show us that there is always hope in the Lord. doesn't matter what you have done, who you are, where you've been, man, there is hope in the Lord. That today is a new day, and all we have is today, right? And I don't care where you are in your journey, how weak you feel, how despondent you feel, man, there is hope of the living God. And that's one thing that God's word reminds me over and over and over. And you're still going to even see that 
in Micah as he reminds the people. Micah chapter 1, open up your Bible. The word of the Lord came to Micah, the Morishite, what he saw regarding Samaria and Jerusalem in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Listen, all you peoples, pay attention, earth, and everyone in it. The Lord God will be a witness against you. The Lord from his holy temple, look, the Lord is leaving his place and coming down to trample the heights of the earth. The mountains will melt beneath him and the valleys will split apart like wax near a fire, like water cascading down a mountainside. All this will happen because of Jacob's rebellion and the sins of the house of Israel. What is the rebellion of Jacob? Isn't it Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Isn't it Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the countryside, a planting area for a vineyard. I will roll her stones into the valley and expose her foundations. All her carved images will be smashed to pieces. All her wages will be burned in the fire. And I will destroy all her idols. Since she has collected the wages of a prostitute, they will be used again for a prostitute. Verse 8. Because of this, I will lament and wail. I will walk barefoot and naked. I will howl like the jackals and mourn like the ostriches. For a wound is incurable and has reached even Judah. It has approached the gate of my people as far as Jerusalem. Verse 16. Shave yourselves bald and cut off your hair and sorrow for your precious children. Make yourselves as bald as an eagle, for they have been taken from you into exile. See, because this is God's word, and even though this is taking place thousands of years ago, this still, is, this still applies to us today. Why? Because we can still identify with this people. In fact, we know that it applies to us today because God's word's eternal. And he reminds us in, in Micah Chapter 1, verse 2, listen, all you peoples. Pay attention, earth. Again, in the context of this is God is speaking to his people. God is speaking to his people. So he's he's speaking to his people, but he's also speaking to the future people. He's speaking to us today. Listen. Listen. The coming judgment is coming. Listen. And who is saying this to us? Number one, who is saying, who's telling us to listen? Who is is telling us about this coming judgment? So number one is the witness. We've got a witness here. We've got somebody testifying. We've got somebody that's saying, hey, this is going to happen. And the thing is, we can believe it or not. We can either recognize this as God's word or not. And if we do recognize it as God's word, that means that we are responsible for that, right? Because God's word doesn't change. First Peter 1 tells us that God's word doesn't change like everything else. It never fades away. It never ends. And as a result of being God's word, you better pay attention to it. Because what it says will happen. And he's speaking to the people. He's speaking to Who's he speaking to? Well, verse 1 tells us he's speaking to Samaria, the the capital of Israel, and also the capital of Judah, Jerusalem. He's saying, you better listen up. The witness is speaking. And where is this witness? Well, he tells us. He says, listen, all peoples, pay attention. Everyone in it, the Lord will be a witness against you. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in heaven. Do we really believe that God exists? Do we really believe that God is in heaven? Do we really believe that God has a plan? Do we really believe that God, uh, you know, that he's in heaven and this is not our home? I mean, what do we believe about God as Christians? Well, what you believe about God is going to determine how you live, how you get up in the morning, how you go to bed at night. I mean, he's not just God on Sundays. He's God 24-7. And if we know God and have that relationship with him, and as we're spending time in God's word, we we remember, oh, 
God, this is who you are, and this is what you're saying, and this is how you're giving me victory and what you're calling me to do, and this is how the Holy Spirit is working through me. Because, God, you're not just transcendent. You're not just out there. You're not just what the agnostic believes, that God is just out there. But you're also imminent. You're, verse 3, you're here. Look, the Lord is leaving his place and coming down to, to trample the heights of the earth. God, you're not only up there, you come down here. God's here with us today. God is present with West Oxford Baptist Church today. And God doesn't stand still. And God does never, we are never to stay the same. We never arrive. We never just coast. Life is always going to be difficult. There's always going to be suffering, and there's always going to be pain. But there is something a lot better than pain and suffering. His name is Jesus, and he's defeated sin and death, and he's got a plan and purpose for us. Why? Because he is the witness. He's the witness, and he's got a reason, verse 5. There's always a reason with God. Nothing ever ca- If you belong to Jesus, that's one thing that gives you great hope, right? Nothing's going to happen to you by circumstance. God is sovereign over your life. Romans 8 for the believer, right? Now, a lost person can't claim the love of God like that because they don't know Jesus. They don't know God. But a believer can. That nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing. And God, you're sovereign over my life. And God, there's a reason. And verse 5 says, all this will happen because of Jacob's rebellion. So, Jacob's rebellion, and also the sins of the house of Israel. So God's judgment is coming down on these nations, on this this tribe that's been split because of rebellion and because of sin. How long does it take for you to walk with Jesus until the point where you become sinless? It's not going to happen, is it? I mean, why did Billy Graham take his last breath in a way that didn't bring shame to him? Because he realized that apart from Jesus, I'm a rebel. And he realized that apart from God's grace, I'm I'm, I'm a sinner. And he walked humbly with his God until he took his last breath. That's why there's no sexual immorality or no financial disgrace. None of that came across him. You can't say that for very many people. I mean, we will be disappointed in human beings because they are sinners and rebels. But our hope is not in human beings. Our hope is in the risen Lord Christ, and that was the problem here. They have forgotten God. So there's a reason. How do I know the reason of God? Because God's word tells me. If you're reading Micah and you don't know the history, maybe you don't know the reason why they're in this predicament. Maybe you don't know the history of Solomon's kids and in, in the history of that. We can, you can see that in the Bible and in, in, in Chronicles and in Kings. You see the sins of Israel. You see how they abandon and walk away from God. You see how they put people in place instead of God. You see how they focused on the wrong things, how they followed after the wrong gods. And don't we see it today in our lives? Don't we see us putting our hope in politics or our money or our reputations or our ability or our health? Being like, like a jackal and like an ostrich. Have you ever heard a, an animal wail or like a, you ever heard a bobcat scream? And it would scare you to death, right? You come running inside. Oh, what's going on? I'm scared. What's that noise? I'm, I'm bothered by it. And we're walking around doing our thing right. And we're not bothered by our sin and our rebellion. Then we're definitely not going to be bothered by other people's sin and rebellion. And if, if, the, if the church doesn't get it right, we're definitely not going to be concerned about how lost people are living. It's going to be, the mentality is going to be, well, it's us against them. I'm like, no, it's God, period. That's it. It's just God. And he has a plan and a purpose, and he wants to be worshipped and adored, and that's why we're here. The consequences are bad. It's so bad that it's just too late for, this, for these people, for most of them. He tells them there, verse 9, your, your wound is incurable. It's, it's reached even Judah. In other words, the, the kingdom of Israel, man, you're done. You're going to be taken away. Assyria is coming in. He's going to wipe you out. But he's also coming to Judah. 
He, he's coming to Judah, and he's going to be coming up so close, and it goes through verses 10 through 15. All the cities around Judah is going to be taken away. It's going to be affected by this sin and rebellion. And he comes up to the gates. It comes up to the, the very important place of Judah, the place of decisions and the place of commerce and all this. It comes up to the gates, and God in his sovereignty says, not yet. Not yet. It's going to come up to the gates, but I'm not going to take them away yet. I'm still going to give them time to repent. But it's not going to be until the year of 586 that Judah will be taken away. The reminder to the people is like Isaiah during around the same time. Isaiah 42, I am Yahweh, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. Or my praise to idols. It still applies today, right? God doesn't change. And God would not share his glory. You know, if I make it about myself, if I make it about what I want, that's sharing God's glory, right? And God's like, listen, Bruce, it's not about you. It's not about your glory. It's about my glory, and I don't share but I promise you, Bruce, if you will submit to me, if you will recognize that and, and humbly receive that and let my glory shine through you, that where I am glorified, you will benefit as well. And you will have that peace and that joy and that contentment like none other because you'll see God working through you in a powerful way. Most of you have heard of Matthew Henry. He was a late Puritan. He said this, Pride makes a God of self. Covetousness makes a God of money. Sensuality makes a God of the belly. Whatever is esteemed or loved, feared or served, delighted in or depended on more than God, that whatever it is we do, in effect, make a God of. And you can't depend on God with five minutes a day. You can't say that you're walking and really depending on God if you just basically give him what's left over. You know, if you're not abiding in that vine on a daily basis, if you're not allowing the word of God just to speak to you, as Tina said, and that takes time. You know, if you want to have Micah speak to you, then you, it's going to take more time because it's going to be, you know, it's written a long time ago to a different people. And, and you've got to first kind of figure out what's going on in the text before the Holy Spirit can say, well, this is how it applies to you. That takes time. It takes solitude. It takes just seeking God and enjoying his presence, allowing his word to speak, speak to you. See, the problem is, the problem is, it's not that we don't really have idols today. The, the problem is we have more idols today than they had back then. See, the reason we have trouble recognizing our own private adulteries is not because we don't have any false gods anymore, but because we have so many. So many, so many that distract us. From who God is. It's like, you know, we come together on, on church on Sunday. It is not about a performance, is it? If, it? if it's about a performance, it's all about, okay, how did it make me feel? If, I, if I'm coming to church looking for a performance, listen, I want good church too, just like anybody else. But if I'm coming to church looking for performance, I'm going to judge God based on how I feel. And God's like, it's not about that. It's not about a performance. I mean, God tells us in his word, listen, I don't care about your performance. If you're not right with me, then forget it. If your worship doesn't, it's not an overflow of your walk with me, forget it. If you're serving in nursery or you're preaching and teaching or if you're just whatever you do, if you're whatever you do for the Lord is not an outflow of who he is, we can forget it. He's the answer. See, Jesus is the answer. He tells them in verse 16, Shave yourselves bald and cut off your hair and sorrow for your precious children. Make yourselves as bald as an eagle, 
for they have been taken from you into exile. This hadn't happened yet, but it's going to. This is this is it's a done deal. It is assured as the word of God spoke, you can rest assured it's gonna happen. It's a done deal. And the sad part about it is these people never even recognize it. They continue to walk away from God. They continue to have death ears. And the only hope for us in moving from bondage to freedom is Jesus. It's Jesus. You will always be loyal to those things that you worship. You may say you have no idols, or you may say you're loyal to Jesus, but I promise you, if I, whatever I take away from you and how your heart responds to that will determine what you're loyal to. If you really worship money, then if I take that away and you become like, I'll just, you know, that's where your loyalty is. Your reputation, whatever it is, health. You always become loyal to the things that you worship. So ask yourself, Christian, do you, does God have to share? Does God's agenda have to be, does it have to be shared with somebody else or someone else or something else in your life? Does he have to share your time with your own personal agenda? That's where we get in trouble. This is my agenda, and this is how I'm going to live my life, and God, this is how you, what you're going to have access to. And God's like, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't live that way. I, that's just not who I am. I'm God. There's no other God, and I'm, I'm God, and uh, it's just only my agenda, period. I'm the one who came and died. I'm, I have set all this up. I, I, you know, it's not about your agenda, and I'm not going to be added to your agenda. I'm not like the gods of the world where you can just live like however you want to live and let me come in. No, I'm God. And I don't share because I'm God, and I'm the only one that can truly give you what you're looking for. I'm the only one that can truly give you that love that you're looking for, that joy, that peace, that contentment. So how do we avoid this from happening? Number one, we, we recognize it. We see it. We have somebody telling us about it, and we're giving us an opportunity to respond. God, I realize that I am not where I need to be. And I realize that I don't want to live in bondage anymore. I want to lay it down and walk in the freedom of the Holy Spirit. I want to live a life where I can see the Spirit of God living through me. It's not just a, something that happens out of the blue. It's, it's, a, it's a, a daily thing where I'm seeing and walking in the presence of the Spirit because it's what God promises us. Listen, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in a church is not only for charismatic churches. It's got to be in Baptist churches and in any church that calls itself a New Testament church. We have to be walking in the freedom of God and not the bondage of idols. So that's our invitation today. That's our invitation that we can leave here today and say, who is like Yahweh? No one. No one is this good. No one is this true. No one is this powerful. No one can take whatever and cast it away and no one can still use my scars no one is like Yahweh God Yahweh you alone can remove the bondage that I'm in and allow me to walk in the freedom and the power of the Holy Spirit age can't do it uh, health can't do it your ability can't do it your money can't do it your jobs can't do it your kids can't do it your family can't do it only God can do it only God can do it. And God wants to use you where you are. In your sovereignty, you are where you are. And if you know Jesus, he wants you to walk in the freedom and the power of the Holy Spirit. So during this time of invitation, lay it down. If something has got you bound up, if you're not where you need to be, lay it down. What is the Holy Spirit saying to West Oxford Baptist Church? How can we, how can we, get used to coming in here every week and just seeing the Spirit work, seeing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And you got to be careful with craving the wrong things, right? Even craving the movement of God can become an idol because it's not about that. It's just about Jesus. It's about being content and being free in, in the Spirit and enjoying who we are in Christ, allowing Him to use us where we are. And how do I know when that's happening? 
because we'll be walking in freedom, because we'll be concerned about our relationship with Christ, because we will enjoy that solitude with God, because we will be broken over sin, because we will have conversations with people. We'll see God working through people to give us those conversations of showing them Jesus. We'll see people start coming to church who are, you know, wanting to hear more about this Jesus that they've been exposed to. That's how we'll know. And I pray it starts today. Maybe we go back home to our families and God, because of prayer, God begins to touch and move and we begin, begin to see God do something in our lives in our midst. But I don't want us to crave the fruit. I want us just to, cr- just to crave Jesus and be content with what he's doing in our lives as we stand to sing. God, would you forgive us? God, would you forgive us? Find us on our knees. Father, come remind us what your church could be. Oceans of your justice, mercy like a stream. All the people said, Man, I'm so excited at what the Holy Spirit's going to do uh, through his word and give us freedom this week and how he's going to work through our lives and change our hearts and give us conversations and see God just continue to use us as a body of Christ. Uh, one quick announcement, uh, we are taking a team to Kentucky. In fact, uh, I know somebody who lives there and they still do not have water. They have power, but no water. So uh, we're, in God's grace, uh, able to take a team. Uh, the state has set up a uh, site there, and so we will be uh, traveling to Prestonburg, uh, Kentucky, uh, next Sunday. So if you'd be, like to be a part of that trip, we will leave uh, Sunday after church, next Sunday, the 14th, uh, and we will uh, drive to that location, about six hours, and we will work Monday, 
Tuesday and Wednesday. And then uh, we will come home Wednesday afternoon, so we'll be back in your beds uh, wherever you live on Wednesday night um, back. So, uh, again, it, there's no um, skills needed. I'm sure at this point they're still just having a lot of uh, what they call tear-out, uh, debris removal, uh, stuff like that that is so inundated with uh, materials. And so we'll probably be doing that. I will know exactly what we're doing uh, should uh, by this week when I call the site and say, okay, uh, how you, caught up are you and you know what we'll be doing. This is the number of people I'm bringing and this is our skill level. Uh, so uh, all skill level uh, are available. Um, we will leave here and come back and I can give you more details of that. But if you'd like to go, you can let me know uh, today. Uh, and uh, we can, I can add you uh, to the list uh, there. Anything else? All right, let's pray. Father, we come to you and thank you. Thank you for the testimony of your grace and your mercy in our lives. Father, I thank you for what you're doing through your people in Kentucky as they're living out the freedom of the Holy Spirit. They may have lost everything, but they know Jesus. And they're looking at all that stuff, and they're like, you know what? I've got Jesus, and everything's going to be okay. And do you know Jesus? Do you have that hope? So thank you for the freedom that's taking place in Kentucky. Thank you for allowing us to go and just to be a part of that truth uh, of what you're doing there, to encourage, uh, to give the hope of Jesus. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of your grace to make this possible. Uh, Father, thank you for those here today, those